So here we come to the Sunday before uh, Christmas, and um, we're in Advent, which is the preparation. How do we how do we prepare ourselves to be open to uh, receive what God wants to do in our life when He breaks into our world in kind of a radical way, uh, and uh, how do we not miss what He wants to do in us and, and through us? And so. Um, the difficulty for me uh, as a preacher on this Sunday is that you all have heard the story before. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like you're going to go, really? Shepherds on the hillside, really? <laughs> you know? uh, and I never heard that. Uh, so um, it makes it a little bit tougher, but um, we're going to be looking at, at Luke um, chapter 2 mostly, um, but um, also chapter 1. But before I do, I want to tell you something that you all know about, and that is... Uh, uh, dog intelligence, um, because we had a fabulous dog for a long time, Joe Cocker. He was a Cocker Spaniel, uh, and uh, <laughs> obviously, and uh, 16 years, and uh, uh, he was like the perfect dog. He just was fabulous. And then, you know, in a fit of weirdness from our last church, the women of the church got together and bought Eileen a younger dog about a year before Joe died, you know, which is like, what are they going to do when I get old? You know, too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> the women of the church, get together and bring in a younger dog. Okay, that's a, don't even think that. Just get that out of your mind right now. So uh, they brought in this, this other dog, uh, and uh, which it was cute, but it was like uh, a severe uh, borderline personality disorder in a, in a dog, you know, which is untreatable in people and really not treatable in a dog. And, you know, and I've been grappling with this and uh, uh, wondering what was wrong. And then, and, and I think we've talked about this before, you know, they, they, they have books. You can go on the internet and find books. I don't know if you know that. And on the interwebs. And, um, and they have books on dog intelligence, and, and, and you all know the number one determiner of dog intelligence, because we've talked about this. What is it? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Once more, you people have been taking notes every time I preach. The number one determiner of dog intelligence, far and away beyond anything else, is... <laughs> and the number one determiner of dog intelligence and is overwhelmingly obedience. Oh, oh yeah, we had that. Yeah, 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 we had that. Yeah, you didn't have that. It's obedience. And uh, it's the one thing, the one thing that shows that, that Maggie, our, our little uh, King Charles Cavalier, is uh, stupid. <laughs> Absolutely, willfully ignorant. Uh, it's like, okay, let's do this, you know. Well, how about stay then? You know, we, we actually have spent, I'm not going to tell you how much, way too much money on dog trainers. They would come into the house and they would have little clicker things. That, that they said, this is really going to train the dog. You click it twice and they'll do this. You know, you click it once and they'll do that. And, and they're really professionals and they come in and they work. And after a way too much money and way too much time, they go, this dog is unteachable. <laughs> I thought it was willfulness. I thought it was a moral problem. I thought it was a spiritual problem. <laughs> but now I've learned. She's stupid. <laughs> she is just stupid. And uh, that is just a fact of life. So I start thinking about that. Of course, you know me. I get in this and I start thinking about the church. You know, <laughs> there you go. Right there. And it just comes right to mind. And that is maybe uh, it's the same for us as it is for those puppies. Maybe. Uh, scripture's been telling us all this time that the number one uh, determiner, uh, the number one mark of, uh, of spiritual intelligence is obedience. Now for me, who's kind of a willful wanderer and ignorer and a selective perception, I've got all of those things going for me, I think. So am I that dumb that I would not tuned in and, and uh, to what God has to say and I wouldn't respond in, in obedience. I would, I would kind of wander off like Maggie, the weird dog does. Is it a, a family trait? 
you know, I, I hope not. But um, so this Christmas, I'm thinking about this, and uh, and in Luke chapter two, um, it, we start hearing about uh, this Christmas night, um, the shepherds living in the fields. Uh, keeping watch over their flocks, an angel of the Lord appears to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified, obviously. And the angel said to them, what? Do not be afraid. And isn't that weird? If you flip over one, one page to um, uh, chapter 1, verse 26, uh, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the uh, a girl's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, and she was deeply troubled. But the angel said to her, the Lord. Do not be afraid. Oh, every, whenever God speaks into our life, he always starts out with, Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. The, the, I'm here for you. You don't have to be afraid. And we're always recoiling. Um, oh, what, what does God want? But um, the thing is, when God enters our world in a radical way, and we get over the fear part, what do we do with that encounter? What do we do with what God speaks into our life? What, is, what do we do with what God calls us uh, toward? And uh, for, for Mary, it was uh, uh, saying, okay, uh, this is what you have in mind. Okay, use me as you will. In fact, it says, uh, um, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be as you've said. And the angel left her. So, so obedience becomes the mark. The angels get together and so they go into town just to see what, what they've been told. And yes, they see it and they tell everybody and then they go back uh, celebrating and they, and they act on what God says to them. And I go, how different is that from, from me? You know, I'm, I'm used to, uh, you know, looking at the Bible and studying God's word and talking with you about these things. And, and then I go, but of course this doesn't apply to me. This, I'm looking for a message for you people because I realize that you people need, you know, to hear God's word in your life so that you will then show how smart you are by obeying, you know, uh, the Lord. And I can be uh, uh, protected from it myself. I can keep up my own little, little barriers. But, uh, and we're going to get to that. But um, the thing that comes to my mind is, in all of this, is that um, growing up in kind of the, well, <laughs> It's kind of redundant to say the old hippie times. You know, <laughs> geez, they were old. But uh, we thought that God was kind of like a vague, gassy thing up in the universe, you know. Not very tangible, sort of a mist. And then we loved it when Star Wars came out because it talked about the Force. We said, oh, yeah, God is like the Force, you know. And let me the Force be with him. Uh, and we had all the same, but it was never very specific. But as we get into Scripture, we see that God always becomes more and more specific as he moves towards us. And, and that, to me, is one of the real key things in, in coming to grips with preparing for Christmas. That God is not going to be entering your world in a generic, vague way. He will get very real and very tangible and very specific with each one of us. I believe that it's no accident that we're here today, that, that he's invited us here, and he has some work to do in each one of our lives, and it's going to be a little bit different, and... Uh, we can't judge what it's going to be for somebody else, but, but he's got some business to do with each one of us. And, and he knows us, he calls us by name, he made us, and he has something for us. And uh, throughout the scripture, it starts out, you know, that the, all the peoples of the earth, and then, and then uh, God calls Abraham, and it'd be the people of the descendants of Abraham, and then the, the uh, descendants of David, the king, and then, uh, and then, Mary, a junior high age girl in Galilee, that's getting more specific. And then you have uh, um, tangible little shepherds living out in the fields, uh, working, um, very real. Um, a baby born in the back of the inn, uh, very real. And, and it's gotten more and more and more and more specific. And I think that that's what God wants to do in each of us. He's not happy with being, oh God of the universe, thou who art my. It's not that at all. It's, um, it's a relationship and a call to, to open our lives to the Lord.
Lord who knows you and loves you and wants to make a difference in your life and through your life. And that is so, so specific. Now, a couple of things. One is that um, obedience doesn't mean that we're going to have a trouble-free, prosperous life. And I, you know, we've talked about this before. I wish it were true. I wish that if we just said yes to God and move forward and followed and were obedient, that everything would just be so great. That, that our prayer time would be very short because we wouldn't have very many needs to share about because everything's great and we all know it. And that's probably why most churches don't have an open sharing time in their prayer time because they're all doing so well, you know. We're just the ones who have a few needs. But, um, but it really doesn't mean that. In fact, Mary, when she... Uh, hears that, that she's going to deliver this baby, she knows she knows exactly that she's in for a world of hurt. She knows just how much they gossip in Galilee. And a junior high girl said, oh yeah, this is what's happening, and uh, it's going to be bad. And she knew it was going to be bad. It said that she was deeply, deeply troubled in her heart. God's getting specific with her, and she's deeply troubled. She knows this means not an easy life. And uh, I don't know how we got the idea that everything's going to work out well and easy if we, if we follow Christ. But, um, but Mary knew that wasn't so. And the shepherds, when they got done uh, telling everybody and worshiping and everything, what's it say? They went back. They went back to the fields. <laughs> they, they had to go back to work. They, they, they couldn't just go off on a new life. They went back to work and went back to to the way things were, and the struggles that they had, and the financial issues, and the family issues, and all those things, none of that changed very much. Now, if we're going to be open to what God has wants to do in our life, it's going to require us um, doing something that, you know, it's kind of awkward to actually preach about this at Christmas, because Christmas is happy, right? And, and, and trouble-free. So, um, but I'm going to use a word that actually uh, probably is one we need to consider, particularly just before God breaks into our world. And that is um, the word repentance, uh, which is kind of, a, it's an awkward one actually to preach about on, on this Sunday because we should be telling sentimental stories. But um, when John, Jesus' cousin, um, begins his ministry, the first thing he says is, Repent. That's his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then, when Jesus started his ministry, his first message was exactly the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. God's rule is near. God's rule is about to break into your life. What should we do? We repent. Now, what's repentance? It's... um. It's not just, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, boy, I messed up there, got that one wrong. Or, well, I tried real hard and it didn't work out well. Uh, could have ended better, you know. It's, it's not, that's not repentance. And repentance is, always starts with um, a couple of elements. One of them is that we stop what we're doing. We stop what we're doing. We can't say, okay, I'm going to keep living the way I like to live. I'm going to keep doing things my way. I'm going to keep charging along in this. And then I'm going to bring God in on the side and let him travel along with me. See, that's kind of, uh, that's a kind of a good strategy if it was me planning it. But, you know, just add God to a busy life. And wouldn't that be great? You got to get the blessings and, uh, you know, God's help when you need it. But for the most part, you're still on your own track and you're doing things your own way. Wouldn't that be cool? That's not what it is. So you have to, you have to stop. West Paul was wrong again. You have to stop and uh, actually stop what we're doing, what we're saying, what we're being, and make some tangible changes. Make a change. Turn. Uh, the, the, the word in the Bible, you know, is like a, it's almost like a, a fish hook. You know, where you're going one direction, you stop, you turn around, and you go another way. That's repentance. That's the visual picture of repentance. You turn and go another way. And, uh, and so then, and then you have to start up again. And uh, um, I've talked to you about Tim, uh, Tim Hansel of 
he passed away a few years ago, but uh, he was he was our family's favorite speaker. Damien loved him the most of all. He's a great speaker. He'd fallen off a mountain and broke his back, and so he's in a lot of pain. But but he wrote uh, "You Got to Keep Dancing," which was an important book for a lot of people. And uh, the last time we heard him speak before he died, he gave Damien a, a button that said "Stop, Change, Start." He said, this is the essence, Damien, of, of living your life in spite of your difficulties. And uh, Damien had shared some struggles with him. And, um, stop, change, start. And, and we've kept that in our family as a tangible reminder. It's just a simple little lapel button, you know, and, and, and yet it captures this whole message of repentance, of what God wants to do in us. And if we're so full of ourselves and we're so full of charging along and getting things done and, and checking off our agenda and, and figuring out everything that we have to do to make our life full and complete and everything. There's no room for God to break into our life. There's no opportunity for him to, to interrupt us. And yet, it will stop. It can bring about some intentional changes and then we start up again in a whole new way. And, and in response to him, empowered by him, directed by him, uh, his agenda instead of ours, and it becomes a, a, an incredible, uh, important thing. Now, um, I really believe in, um, you know, relationships, and I believe in small groups and those kind of things. I, I'm a, I, in theory, I think they're wonderful. Um, I believe everybody ought to be in relationships that are healthy and accountable. Uh, it's just difficult for me to be in them. I gotta tell you, uh, it's not that easy. And so, um, I gotta tell you about something that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as some of you know, I, I had a friend for uh, over 30 years. Uh, we were close and did a lot of things together and everything. And we went through a divorce this last summer. Now, for those of you on the video, Eileen and I did not get divorced, okay? This is just letting you know, I don't want to hear down the road, you know, that we got, this was a, another friend, not my wife. So, but, but after 30 years of, uh, of pretty close friendship and doing things together, um, we just ended our relationship uh, and pretty dramatically and pretty uh, uh, verbally violently, you know? And uh, we dumped the garbage cans in the past on both people, you know, as we walked out the door. And, uh, and I felt fine about it. I, I had no trouble with that. Okay, 30 years. In fact, what he said was 30 years is a long time to flush down the toilet, but I'm doing it. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, cool. And so um, I didn't have a problem with it until I went to the men's Bible study on Wednesday morning. And these guys are presumptuous. <laughs> We've been going through uh, Proverbs Whatever the day of the week is, you open it up to wherever the Proverbs are for that day. Because I guess there's like 31 Proverbs, I don't know. And so uh, they opened it up and it was talking about uh, healing in relationships and uh, being, being authentic with each other and reconciling. And I let the conversation go probably too long without interrupting it. And, uh, <laughs> and they turned on me like a pack of dogs. <laughs> They turned on me and said something like, well, John, you've shared how you and one of your friends many, many years went through a divorce this summer, and you're fine with that. Yeah. So, well, it's, it seems to say here in the Proverbs that, you know, that's not what God wants. He wants us to be reconciling and moving towards each other. Yeah, I think y'all should. <laughs> Pastor's good response. I'll pray for y'all to do that, you know. And they wouldn't let go. It was like, you know, the pit bull with the postman's trousers, you know, they're just pulling on me and, and uh, I couldn't get out of there. And uh, and they kept coming back to it. They'd circle around and they'd come back. And John, I think, you know, really, you ought to do something about this. Well, you know, you can't wait. It's after the fact. It's all over. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, who needs that? You know? I'll go make a new friend. Well, you know, this, I want to talk to you about what the Bible says we're supposed to do. I got to tell you, it was irritating. <laughs> and they finally wore me down to the point where just to shut them up. You're laughing, Dave, because you were there. But just to shut them up, I said, okay, 
I'll call up and see if he wants to get together for lunch or something and talk. Now, I knew he wouldn't, so I was fine. I was fine. <laughs> but I get these guys off my back, you know. At least I tried. Well, that started a flurry of phone calls back and forth and emails and text messages and da 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 and pretty soon we're meeting. We're just supposed to meet at a restaurant in the afternoon. Oh. So went in, sat down. I was about a 10 on the tension scale, Rube, <laughs> right out there, you know. And, uh, and he was not feeling any better, and we, we spent a couple of hours talking about relationship, where we've been, what's happened, misunderstandings along the way, misinterpretations, sometimes correct interpretations of bad things said, you know, all of that we later worked it all out and actually came to a reconciling peace to actually be friends, to, to continue to be friends. There's some limits, to, you know, in a relationship, but, but it'll be different, but it's going to be reconciled. And I walked out of there going, this is all the fault of the men in the Bible study. <laughs> I was happy with that divorce. I was happy living my life on my terms. And here they come along and intrude in my life and say, no, God wants you to do something different. That's kind of presumptuous, isn't it? Really, when you think about it, to talk to the pastor that way? I'm just, I'm just bringing it up, you know, I'm just saying. Just saying. They didn't have to change that day. I did. And, and you know what? They were absolutely right. They were absolutely right. I had to stop and change and start. I had to do what I've been preaching to y'all about. Um, so I guess that means I'm smarter than you thought, huh? I'm smart because <laughs> I actually did it. But, but it took a lot of pressure, and it's not easy to stop and change and start. I don't want you to get the idea that that's an easy thing to do. It went against everything that I usually do. And to, to go back in and say, all right, well, you know, forgive me for this. I'll forgive you for that. We'll work on that. Here's some things. We can go out friends. That actually probably a little bit of a Christmas miracle right there. Um, my fear is, of course, now I'm going to have to do that with everybody I've alienated. You know, and that's, <laughs> that's going to be an endless stream, won't it? <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, I think that... I, how do we get ready for Christmas? How do we prepare for God breaking into our world? We have to give up our attitude and expectation that we've got it right. As long as we've got it right, we don't need God to break into our world. We're not open to it anyway. I know I'm not. I got a better way. Lord, if you need help with anything, you come to me. Jesus, if you have any questions about how things ought to work in the church, you, you come to me and I'll clarify that for you. You know? He's going, I don't really need your input, uh, John. You're definitely not in management. You're more sales, you know, <laughs> when it comes to the kingdom. Uh, I can handle it myself, God says. Will you allow him to handle it himself in your life? That's really the question this Christmas. Will you say, all right, I'll stop and change and start up again? If we would do that, there's, there's no knowing what, what God could unleash in us and through us and around us. Uh, we, we could begin to uh, see God's agenda before we see our own. Instead of just naturally jumping in and responding the way we would normally and we've always responded, we could stop and pull back and say, Lord, how do you want a response to this? Um, we could treat people differently. We could actually treat ourselves differently. That would be a great gift. So, when God comes to us, the first
first thing that's said is, don't be afraid. Don't have to be afraid. I bring you good news. A great joy. Because unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And that's good news. So what do we have to do? Stop. Change. You're not very confident about that. You have to stop. Change. And start. Okay. So Lord, bring us your peace and your power. Bring us your presence. As you're born anew into our lives, help us not to miss you because of our agendas and our attitudes and our ways of doing things. Help us not to miss you because uh, we're hiding from you. We don't, we don't want you to interrupt our life. Give us the courage to uh, stop and to, and to change and allow you to change us. And, and then give us the courage to start up again as new people renewed people. That's our Christmas prayer in Jesus' name.